Nehemiah has done a great work through God. And what the work that Nehemiah has done, as we've seen in verse of 1, of chapter 1 all the way to chapter 12, we find out that Nehemiah discovers that while he is in a Babylonian uh, area, while he is serving another king and he's there in that providence, that the walls of Jerusalem had not been rebuilt. And if you've been here, you know what happens, that he asked for permission from the king, can I go back and rebuild the walls? And in doing so, I'll come back and serve you, king. And the king does that, and the king must have had such a great relationship with Nehemiah that not only he sends Nehemiah with letters showing that he has authorization from that king to do so, but he sends with him a special envoy of kind of bodyguards, protection to get him from point A to point B. And then what he also does, he says, and by the way, while you're going back to Jerusalem, here's the paperwork that you can get all the timber and what you need building supplies from my supplier, which will be the very best, and take that to Jerusalem to do the job. Well, he does that. And, and when he gets there, he is met with opposition by at least three or four big uh, names that have present themselves that are constantly complaining about the work he's doing. And he explains to them it's not his work, it's God's work. But he does not allow their opposition and criticism to stop him from doing the work. You remember that it only took 52 days to establish the work and finish the work. 52 days to build this wall and to make sure that Israel was protected. And then Nehemiah has an awakening moment. He realizes that in his work that he had done in rebuilding the wall, what actually needed to be rebuilt was what? The people's relationship with God. And so a revival took place, if you will, and they read the Word of God, they, they heard the Word of God, and, and they repented, and, and in doing so, God blesses them. And then we found out in the last two chapters what happens. He knows the city needs to be populated. So a tenth of those of the Jewish descendants move into the city walls, and he says anyone that would like to volunteer to come into the city walls to start over, please feel free to do so. And, and they did. And it says they were blessed. And remember we said that was not like them going to some resort. They were having to start all over. So just because that they stepped up or volunteered didn't mean they were volunteered to go to some luxury place. They were going to have to actually start all over. And so it was a big deal for them. And then we stopped there. And when we stopped in the last chapter, and that was what has happened, just to sum up chapters 1 through 12. Then we get to chapter 13. Nehemiah this time has gone back to the king who has allowed him to go rebuild the walls. He's gone back and it's been several years have passed. If you come on Wednesday nights, and I hope that you will find time in your busy schedules if you can to do so, but on Wednesday nights, one of the statements I like to make is that one verse of Scripture can mean a day, it could be a week, it could be a year, it could be a hundred years. So just because one verse comes after the next does not mean it's happening right in that period of time. Well, what we see in chapter 12 and chapter 13 is that there is a great span of time that's taken place and Nehemiah is out of place. And how many of you have ever heard of the old saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play? You've heard that before? You know the old saying is true. When leadership... And when correction, when they see that leadership, when the parents are gone, then what the children do a lot of times is so much different than what they would do if the parents were there. And so what we're going to find out in chapter 13, believe it or not, people do not change in the way they act. They go through cycles. They've... Lord, I've done wrong. I want to do better. Hip, hip, hurrah. And then what happens so easily? We fall back into the pit of our temptations. 
that happens when we get our eyes off of God's Word. That's really what has taken place. Anytime I, or if you would be honest as well, anytime you have felt pulling away from God, it's when we have done what? We've pulled away from reading His Word and, and listening to Him. So Nehemiah gets Word. Believe it or not, bad news does travel. So Nehemiah gets word that these people have about lost their mind. They have done things that they promised God they would not do. They're now, they are going to allow people to move into the temple complex that had no business living there. They're going to have sailing during the Sabbath. They're going to intermarry with pagan people. And all of these things and so much more, if you remember what happened, is that Nehemiah said, don't do it. So let's start in Nehemiah 13 verse 1. So I give you a foundation of what's going on. So let's look at this. And at that time, the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. Now, this would be periodically. You would take the Torah and there would be uh, a set reading, and even today in Israel they have that same thing. If you go into a Jewish home, they have a set reading for a certain period of time. So this would not have been something unusual. So even in rebellion, this would have been taking place that there would still be an act of reading, but not accepted in all ways. The command was found written in that, that, that no Amorite, no Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Instead, they hired Balaam against them to curse them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. And when they heard the law, they separated all those who of mixed ascent from Israel. Now before that happened, listen what took place. Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of God. He was a relative of Tobiah. Now remember Tobiah is not one of your good guys. Revelation, excuse me, uh, Nehemiah, I, I, Revelation, he'll have to, we'll deal with him in the book of Revelation, I'm sure. But in Nehemiah 13, what you find out is that there's a group of people that had been constantly the enemy of God because they were attacking the messenger of God. And here it says that he was a relative of Tobiah and had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offering. Let me pause there. Let me just paint the picture. So the guy that was such a thorn in Nehemiah's side, after Nehemiah has left, guess what they do with this guy? Not only do they simply treat him with kindness, they decide to allow this pagan, believing God-hating person to move into a, the, one of the rooms of the temple complex that's supposed to have been used for gathering the offering for God. So what has happened is that not only have the people rejected God, but in their absence of worshiping God, they'd have decided to move the enemy of God into their house. Now some of you are going to get this right now. Others it might take a little bit longer and that's okay. But let's plow that ground just for a few seconds. Whenever we remove God from whatever we are in, our work, our home, our schools, our relationships, do not think for one minute that when you deliberately remove God that that place will remain vacant and empty. Don't you think that? Because what happens in our homes, in our schools, in our jobs, in our institutions, and in anything that we're involved in, when we take God out of the equation, Satan, who is not a builder... Satan has never built anything. Satan is one who always tries to come in, deceive, destroy, and tries to take what has been built. <coughs> Satan will see the emptiness of that space. And Satan will say, well, obviously, if they do not have God there, 
then it means I'm okay to be here. If you've ever been on a vacation, you know this has happened before to you, I'm sure, that you have gone traveling and you see, especially during certain seasons of the year, you'll see a sign that's flashing on the hotel or the motel that you might be staying at or wanting to stay at, flashing that says, No Vacancy. The reason why they do that is because they want you to know that there was no need for you to stop and waste your time in asking, is there a room available? So if you see the sign that says vacancy, you automatically say, oh good, that means they've got extra space for me. Correct? You can follow along with that. Well, let me say this to you. When you have Jesus Christ, the moment you're saved, and it's not a progressional thing that you get saved and and then later on God does this and does that. No, the moment you're saved, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost comes into you at that moment. And there is a spiritual light that gets turned on, church, that you can't see, but the devil sees it. And that spiritual light that comes on at the moment of salvation says, there is no room in here anymore for you, Satan. Satan is not going to try to give up in wanting to come and be in your life. Did you know that? Satan is like the boyfriend that wouldn't give up. Let us not be silly enough to take him back. Amen? Amen? And so what we see here is that whenever this fellow by the name of Tobiah, if you remember, Tobiah was one that ran his mouth, caused problems, and did everything he could to stop Nehemiah. And now what have they done? They have moved this joker into the temple. I love what the the Bible does not sugarcoat anything. Come on, folks. If we were writing this about our family, what would we say? We would write it this way. Well, Nehemiah had left, and we figured things had smoothed out between him and Tobiah. And since we figured that, and we felt sorry that Nehemiah and him had had problems, we wanted just to show Tobiah that we were okay with him. And so we invited Tobiah to come on in and and we have a room that we can clean out and let you stay in, old Tobiah. I'm going to ask you this, women. <clears throat> Listen to me. And women, I want you to answer this question. If you're married today and your husband has had a girlfriend before he got married to you, no. and that girlfriend... And that girlfriend comes to the house and says, your husband said there's an extra room that y'all are not using. Can I come and stay here? The answer would be no. Men, it would be the same with us, would it not be? Some man come knocking on your door saying, hey, I used to date your wife. I heard there's an extra room here. Can I come and stay? I'm sure your answer would be even more no, right? All right. The point I'm getting at, you hear me say that, you laugh, and you think that is foolish. Right? But come on, church. That's what they're doing here with Tobiah. They're letting the enemy come in and live in a room he had no business to be in. I'm going to ask you this to search your soul. Who or what have you allowed to move in your life that they had no business to be in it? Ah, uh, come on now. If I, was in, if I was in a Pentecostal church right now, you'd be clapping your hands and say, Amen, you're right about that. But we're bad Pentecostal, I know. I, I, tell you something funny about, I tell you something funny about that. Last week I was stopped in Food Line in Burgall and a lady came up to me and she said, Aren't you the pastor at Atkinson? And I said, Yes, I am. Not the whole town, but just, you know. She said, I had heard that y'all are no longer Baptists. And uh, this is honest, down in Burgall at the food line, and I said, well, that's the first I heard. I said, if we're not, I said, we've remained Christian, though. I, but I, we're still Baptist as far as I know. It's funny how rumors get out, isn't it? I guess they've just heard that we're having some good church services. 
And the point I'm getting at, notice what happens. They move him in. And then it says that this was the place that the frankincense, the articles of the tenth grain, the new wine, the oil prescribed to the Levite signers and the, the, the singers and the gatekeepers along with the con- contribution of the priests. So they put him in and stopped collecting what was needed for God's work. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot love two gods. There's only one true God. And in verse 6, or excuse me, verse... Yes, 6, it says, While all of this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem. Now Nehemiah's wanting you to make sure to know this. This garbage wouldn't take place if I was there. Are you with me? Because I can guarantee you if something happened at your house with your children and you showed up, you probably could make the same statement. Y'all know this mess wouldn't be flying if I was here. See, the Bible is is just as plain as it can be. And it says the following, it says, Nehemiah said, this didn't happen when I was there. I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later then I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah. He's saying, I discovered what the high priest did. The high priest is guilty of sin. You know why? Because the, the preacher allowed the devil to come in. Let's just play it easy, as, you know, make it as simple and easy as we can. I will make a, a statement. There will be many pastors that will go to the pit of hell because they were not believers in Christ and they allowed Satan to come in their church and run the church because they were willing to do so to build that church in the image of man and not the image of God. May God forgive us if we forsake the truth. And it says this, it says, And then I discovered the evil that had been done, that Elias had done on behalf of Tobiah, providing him a room in the courts of God's house. Notice that he throws him in as the group of allowance just by giving him a room. And let's continue. I was greatly displeased. Well, I, I hate to tell you what the, the word in Hebrew for that is. Because when you see the actions, if you've not already read Nehemiah 13, it will blow your mind when you see what Nehemiah does. It says, I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobias' household's possessions out. Let me just tell you what happens. Nehemiah gets back to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he sees with his own eyes what he had heard. He does not go to the place that Tobiah was at in that room that was set aside for God's offering and say to him, you know, I hate to inconvenience you and... I know you've been here and and I see you already got your family's pictures up on the wall. Can you somehow, you know, about 30 days, can we work something out that maybe you can just leave and we just keep this, you know, civil? No! Nehemiah goes in there and I will tell you this, Nehemiah is not some uh, sissified man. Nehemiah walks in there. He sees what's happening. He grabs the picture of Tobias' family if they had such a thing on the wall. Whew, throws it out like a frisbee. He grabs the couch, the bed, the linings, the clothes and everything and throws it all out. You want me to tell you why? It's because for revival to really take place, there's got to be an expulsion of the things that God is not pleased with. You cannot have a church of the living God and be God's people if you're bringing in and leaving in the things of the world. It's got to go. It's got to go. Now don't go home and say, well, my children ain't saved, so that give me a good reason to throw them out. I can see some of us thinking right now, let's see, they're 19, they're 20, we can, okay, yep, you're out the door. No. What I'm saying though is you see what's happening. Nehemiah... His passion leads to his action. I heard a preacher preach before on a text like this, and he said, what you're passionate about is what you'll get mad about. 
what you're mad about shows what you're passionate about. Can I say this to you? And I don't, I mean, I don't mean to offend you too bad, but some of you are more mad and passionate about governmental stuff than you are of God's stuff. Am I right? You get so mad and watch something on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, all that. You get so, come on now, you get so mad, throw a shoe at the TV, turn the TV off. This is true. Come on, folks. My God is not up for re election. Jesus will always be king. Amen. And so, what we see here, it says that he throws out his stuff. Oh, my gracious. And not only takes the stuff and throws it out of the room, it says, I ordered that the room be purified. Come on. He says, and it's more than just getting some Lysol, folks. You know, when the house has a stink in it, you ever had any rooms in the house have a stink in it? He says, it's time to clean it out. Let's pray, let's clean, let's anoint this place. Ladies, have you ever, or men, burnt something in the kitchen and the oven and you know it's that smell, you've got open windows, you've got to get it out of there, right? He says, I don't even want the smell of Tobiah in this place. Boy, I could, oh, I could have a sermon just on that. <laughs> Is the smell of the enemy still in your presence? Oh, yeah. You might think you got him hid, but we can still smell him. And then it says that he had the articles of the house of God restored, meaning he got, got out the junk and he put God's stuff in, along with the grain offering and the frankincense, and also found out that because the portion of the Levites had not been given each of the Levites and the singers and the performing of the services had gone back to their own fields, meaning he had found out since they moved Tobiah in that people stopped giving in the offering and the minister and the singers and the gatekeepers and everybody that was in charge of keeping the temple complex running had to leave and go back to the field and work. And then it says this, Therefore I rebuke the officials. He did it to their face. It's easy to be keyboard warriors, isn't it? But here he says he went to their face and said, You're wrong in what you have done. This rebuke is because he loved them enough to tell them they were wrong. He said to them, it says that I rebuke the official saying, why has the house of God been neglected? I wondered that at times myself. Why do we neglect the house of God? I gathered the Levites and the singers together and stationed them at their post. What he says is, we're going to put things back in order. And then all of Judah brought a tenth of the grain offering, the new wine and the oil in the storehouse, and I pointed a treasure over the storehouse. Shemalah the priest, and Zodak the scribe, and Padiah the Levites, and Hanan and son of Zechar, and Matiah the assistant to assist them. Now you might say these names mean nothing to me, Pastor. Why would we take time to read them? It's because even while Nehemiah's gone, he gets back, not everybody had lost their mind. There were still some that still loved God and were still trying. And those people Nehemiah used to restore what was happening. Let me take a little rabbit, rabbit path and get back on the street here. Even though everyone at your job acts like the devil, doesn't mean you got to act like the devil. And you can need to realize that once things start getting back on track, you might be the one God's going to have to use to restore the godliness in that place. Okay? Let's continue. It says they were responsible for the distribution of their colleagues. And then verse 14, Remember me for this. Oh, do Lord, oh, do Lord, remember me. Amen? Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God for this service. Now it's interesting that what he is saying is God, I threw the, I threw the, the bum out. I mean, think about what we're saying here. I've got rid of Tobiah. We've got the people back in the mindset. God, please remember what I've done. 
Have you done anything worthy enough to tell God, please remember me? Let's continue. At that time I saw people in Judah treading wine press on the Sabbath. What did they say a few chapters earlier? We're going to keep the Sabbath holy. We're not going to work. We're going to honor God. And now what are they doing? They're, they've gone back to what they had been doing. They were out acting like the pagans. They were also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys along with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And so I warned them against selling food on that day. And then the Tyrians living there were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah sees it and says he rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil that you're doing? Profaning the Sabbath day. Don't or didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all this disaster on us, on this city? He's saying, guys, you're doing the very same thing that caused the city walls to fall down the first time. Have you already forgotten what God does? And then he continues, And now you are rekindling His anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He's saying that God can be angered. And when he says rekindling, it is actually talking about a little flame, a little ember in that fire. And he says you're, you're keeping on stroking it. And you don't even realize that there's going to be a big fire, a danger spiritually that's coming. And then he continues to say that after he says, have you not considered this? Are you not thinking about these things? It says in the next verse coming out, it says that when the shadows, let's just go to verse 19, and when the shadows began to fall on the gates of Jerusalem just before the Sabbath, I gave orders for the gates to be closed, not open on the Sabbath. And why he's doing that is because they were, they were uh, buying and selling. He says, if I shut these gates down, then they're not, they won't be tempted to do it. You get what I'm, you remember old blue laws? Okay, he said, if I, if I shut it down, they won't be tempted. I posted some of my men at the gate so that no goods could be entered to on the Sabbath day. I love this part. How many of you know that even though he did what was right, they're going, they're going, have you ever had a child test you? Yeah, have you ever had a child? You know what it means. You know, and you can say, baby, I don't, I don't think you want to go there. And here it says that once or twice... The, once or twice, the merchants and those who sell all kinds of goods camped outside of Jerusalem. He said, yeah, a couple of times they tried to, uh, to do what's wrong. But notice what happens. But he warned them, why are you camping in front of the wall? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. Well, I think he's proved already when he threw two by out. He's like, look, if you, don't, if you think I'm joking, go ask who by and, and look at the bruises on him. It says, after that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Man, imagine if our word was that strong that the world would listen to us. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me also, this will be one of the four times that he asked God in the short prayer, remember me also my God, and look on me with compassion in keeping with your abundant faithful love. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. So now what have they done? They moved a center into the temple complex. They were doing business on the Sabbath. And the third thing is they were doing what? Marrying the outside unbelieving godless people. And it says, half their children spoke the language of Ashdod, the language of one of the people, but could not speak Hebrew. You know why? It's because the women that were marrying them did not know Hebrew, so they were teaching them their language. Because mamas at that time typically were with the kids more than the daddies were, right? Makes sense? It says, I rebuke them. Who is it rebuking? The men who married these women. He says, I rebuke them, curse them, I want to skip this part, but maybe you need to hear it. 
Nehemiah, it says, I even watched enough pro wrestling while I was in Babylon. It says that I beat some of their men and pulled out their hair. Now do not underline that. It's not one of them underlined Bible verses. <laughs> I don't want... I, I'm not saying that God's calling you to do that. So don't get in a fight with your neighbor because he's doing something and say, well, God said in Nehemiah chapter 13 that I, he beat them and pulled their hair out. But what I'm trying to show to you is Nehemiah is a full man. He's fully man. And his passion for God is so great that it moves him to whoop up on these people. <laughs> I'm almost done. It says, that he, he said, Then I forced them to take an oath before God and said, You must not give your daughters in marriage or to your sons to take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. And then he's going to give them an example. He says, Now let me remind you why. Did not King Solomon of Israel sin in matters like this? And there was not a king like him among the nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign women drew him into sin. And why then should you hear about you doing all of this terrible evil and acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Verse 28, Even one of the sons of Jehoah died, Son of Eliashib, remember the high priest that had allowed to buy the move in? It said that even one of the high priest's sons had become a son in law to Samballot. Remember Samballot? He's buddies with Tobiah that hated Nehemiah. So not only what have they done, they've taken one of the enemies of God and allowed that enemy to marry into their family. And then let's continue. Go to verse 29. Remember me then. Remember then, my God, for define, following the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Verse 30. So I purified them from everything foreign and assigned some specific, specific duties for to each of them and the priest and the Levites. So he gives them certain jobs that they need to be doing. In verse 31, And I also arranged for the donation, donation of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. And Nehemiah is going to finish all this up with that phrase that I taught the little kids or work with them on this. He finishes this book. And you know what? This book is so, it's just amazing to me because it just shows you the good, the bad, and the indifference of what was happening there. And he finishes it by saying this. He says, Remember me, my God, with favor. Now, I asked you this today. Do you feel comfortable enough in the way you've raised your children that when you're not here, there'll be a day you're not going to be here, mamas and daddies? You know that, right? Do you feel comfortable enough the way you've raised your children, the way you've read the Scriptures with them, the way you've prayed with them, the way you've sung with them, the way you've lived your life in front of them, that when you're not here anymore, that they won't rebel against God, but they will remember what you had instilled in them and that they will carry that to their children and their children's children. I hope every one of us have at least tried to do that. You cannot control the way your children turn out. You can't do it. But you can control the way you guide them, pray for them, love them, anoint them. It's, you can control that. See, Nehemiah, I want to just finish up with all this. Nehemiah couldn't control what the people did when he went back to his job under the king of Artaxerxes. But when Lord got back and He came back, He made sure to do what? Correct what had gone wrong. Now today I'm going to ask you this. Are you got enough spiritual guts to correct what's going wrong around you? When you go in your house 
and you see the things that is not pleasing to God, do you have enough spiritualness to get rid of those things? You say, well, pastor, why should I? Well, if he threw Tobiah out, what do you need to throw out? What magazines do you need to throw out? What searches on the computer do you need to stop looking up? What things in your life need to be poured down the drain? Exactly what needs to stop? Because if you notice this, it took the man of God to say enough of this and he did not play around with it. He just said, it's done. We're done with this. You're out of here. And that's what we need to do. Because he knew it was more important than God to make God happy than it was to make Tobias feelings feel happy. Are you willing today to compromise the Word of God and ruin your business just to make some extra money? I'm not talking about working on Sundays. I'm not talking about criticizing a restaurant that's working open on Sundays. What I'm saying to you is this. Are you willing to be godly in your business? And then the next says, are you willing enough to tell your children not to marry someone that just because the outside looks great, the inside might be horrible? And if your son comes to you or your daughter comes to you and says, but I want to be with them because they're hot. You need to say this, well, hell's hot too. Right? Come on. You need to tell them it's more important to please God in their relationships than to please their own sinful, carnal nature. Amen. Right? Amen. And then last, when we come before God, will we have done enough good works? And we're not saved by these works. But will we have done enough to say, God, please remember what I have done? I hope the day that I lie on that bed for the last time and close my eyes, and if I know that would be the last time I close my eyes, I hope that I can be able to say, God, please remember the good job and the good works I've tried to do for your kingdom. Can you also say the same thing and say, God, please remember because I'm trying. And He will bless you. And if you can't say that today, guess what? When you leave here, start trying a little harder. And maybe... Just maybe you'll see the results quicker than you even realize it. Let's pray.